all for coming. Uh, apparently, you haven't had enough sturgeon yet, so you've got a whole other afternoon of it. Um, we're going to start things off with our sturgeon research in New York session with Lisa Hulse uh, talking about sturgeon wealth. So thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. So my talk is the easy, non-technical transition from this morning. Uh, so you can all start digesting and relax. Um, I have the privilege to be the cheerleader and reporter for a lot of the work we do on sturgeon here in New York State. Um, so I'm going to be presenting work that is the hard work of many people that were here doing it long before me, and probably several people who, who will be here doing it long after me. Roger's not one of the people who will be here doing it after me. Um, so what do I mean by sturgeon wealth in New York? So. New York is, is wealthy in that we have three different species of sturgeon, which I think sometimes doesn't get remembered uh, by folks across the, the state, but I've had the, the fortune to work on all three of those species in some way. Um, I've had a chance to uh, be out in the field looking for all three of those species at some point in my career. So in terms of the number of fish and species we have, we're doing very well. Uh, I mean wealth in terms of the number of cooperators and the energy we've developed behind sturgeon restoration in New York State and sturgeon protection. And we're actually starting to develop some wealth in our knowledge about the sturgeon specifically in New York State and benefiting greatly from the work that's being done by our partners and mentors in the other parts of the country as well. So, um, you know, people like Ron and Nancy from this morning, we've used your information and your expertise extensively over the years. We get great support from our federal partners. We get great support from our university partners. We get great support from uh, the tribal nations as well as our um, zoo and aquariums uh, cooperators. So we have uh, folks from the Seneca Park Zoo here today that are big cheerleaders in terms of public outreach. We've got two brand new baby sturgeon at the Aquarium of Niagara, which is right over here. If you want to go visit them, they're adorable. Um, and they have their own display tank. So we've been very, very benefit benefited by, I think, everyone's um, camaraderie and cooperation in this issue over the last almost 40 years, holy cow. Um, and I'm gonna just run through some highlights and hopefully give you some teasers and whet your appetite for yet more church and talks this afternoon. But we're gonna be zooming down into New York State and what's been going on here across our entire spectrum of sturgeon work. So there you go. We saw the sturgeon of <laughs> the U.S. earlier. This is the sturgeon of the world. We are fortunate to have the three species here. The Atlantic, which is the largest species we have. Uh, they grow in excess of, I think, 12 to 15 feet. Um, then we have our Lakers, which are the middle size. And we have short nose, which are our little babies. Uh, and the Atlantics and the short nose share some habitat in the Hudson. Um, and then obviously the lake sturgeon are mostly in the Great Lakes drainage, and they also fall out into Lake Champlain as well as you heard this morning. So all three of these species in New York unfortunately have suffered similar fates over the years. Um, <clears throat> all three species were important to native tribes uh, as, as a spring food source. They used their other parts of their bodies extensively. There's another talk um, at, the, at the meeting this, this year about those traditional uses of sturgeon. I encourage you to, to uh, go see it. It's very interesting. Um, one of the main products that bridged the, um, before the meat and caviar industry was the isinglass taken from the swim bladders of sturgeon. It's a very high quality gelatin used in wine making and hair making, still used today. Um, there was also an adhesive quality when those swim bladders were boiled down that uh, native uh, people used it to, as a pretty effective waterproofing from what I understand. So um, it was very important, and it was very important to early settlers in the United States. The, uh, the original uh, colonies down in, in Virginia used sturgeon extensively as a food source to get them through starvation periods. Um, all three species have suffered from overfishing, either direct or indirect, and uh, from coastal and riparian development, damming, uh, channelization, alteration of spawning areas, as you heard a lot about this morning. And all three of these species have legal protection. So I'm going to start with a species we didn't hear about this morning much. <coughs> so both short nose and Atlantic, as I said, they share, they have a significantly overlapping range. Short nose are more homebodies in the estuary in the Hudson River, uh, whereas the Atlantics, they use the Hudson for spawning in some nursery area and they travel extensively offshore up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, and both species are federally protected. 
So, in alphabetical order, we're going to start with Atlantic sturgeon, our, our big one. <coughs> uh, hopefully, some of you are familiar with some of this, but I'll go through it quickly. Uh, there was commercial harvest of Atlantic sturgeon as early as the 1600s for some of those things I discussed, Isinglass and other things. Um, and in New England, the stocks of Atlantic sturgeon collapsed prior to the 1800s the first time. Uh, a new wave of commercial fishing in, that, in the 1800s started in Delaware Bay. We have a cooperator from Delaware Bay we hear this today. Um, and that harvest peaked in 1890. Um, the Hudson River stock, they were plentiful, they were common. Um, it was often a food of immigrants. It was served as bar food, believe it or not. Smoked sturgeon meat and caviar were salty and plentiful and on the bars to get people to drink more beer. Um, and that's where the term Albany beef came from. It was so extensively canned and shipped out of Albany um, back in the day. So, what's going on these days with Atlantic sturgeon? It's not all bad news. Um, New York retained a commercial fishery for Atlantic sturgeon until 1996. Um, after that, the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission is the governing body for interstate fisheries uh, up this way. They closed the entire fishery coastwide in 1998, and there was a planned 40-year recovery period um, that they put into place. Recovery had been, been shown, there were indications, but um, it was still listed as endangered by National Marine Fisheries uh, Service, which is, they handle the marine listings the way Fish and Wildlife Service does for the anatomist and inland uh, species. And that, that was declared in 2012, um, and was then subsequently added to the state list of endangered species and they have distinct population segments designated at the federal level, so Hudson River stock is its own, um, and that's got the endangered status. Uh, however, the good news is juvenile abundance surveys from 2006 to the present uh, are beginning to indicate recovery. You're gonna hear from Amanda Hicks about that in a little while. And the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission is planning to complete a benchmark stock assessment in fall of 2017, fall of this year, to see what the coastwide trend is. Um, it, the Hudson River retains one of the largest stocks of this animal. So we've got that going for us. We're hoping to show some impressive recovery. So short-nosed sturgeon. Um, they mostly stay resident, as I said, in the Hudson River. They're generally not targeted in the fisheries, but they suffer as bycatch. Um, and because of their, their residence in the Hudson River, they have had a, a horrible history of contamination of PCBs and its congeners and other things. Um, the damming of the river, channelization of the river, the heavy alteration by industry. Um, and they've, they've persisted. Um, they're still there. Again, we have one of the largest stocks on the East Coast, but not the largest. And this species, believe it or not, has the longest history of protection of all tree species. It was actually listed in the 60s. It predates the Endangered Species Act at the federal level, and is still currently federally and state endangered. But again, this is like you know, bad news, good news. So the good news about short-nosed sturgeon, and there's an entire talk about this coming up a little later, uh, PCB levels in the Hudson River are dropping. Generally, water quality in the Hudson River has improved. Uh, since the late 1960s, we know a lot more about their habitat use and where they are in the river these days. And there's definitely a recovery trend indicated. Um, some of the, the data is getting a little long in the tooth, but it's still hopeful. Uh, the population estimate from sampling done in, the, in 79 and 80 uh, <coughs> indicated a, an estimated stock. The estimate was around 13,000 animals. Um, and then that uh, estimate was redone with comparable data between 1994 and 1970, or 1997 uh, by Bain et al. And that estimate was, you know, median was around 59,000. So that's a huge growth rate in that time period. And all indications are that trend is continuing. And again, we'll hear more about that in a little while. And now we see that range map before, but here's Lake Sturgeon, and I wanted to show again up into Canada. This we, we share this resource all the way down into the Mississippi Basin and all the way up into Canada with our neighbors. Um, we'll zoom into New York. So obviously New York has an extensive range of this fish from Lake Erie all the way over to Lake Champlain, and this fish originally suffered as bycatch and herring and whitefish fisheries in the Great Lakes prior to it being targeted on its own. As the stocks of Atlantic sturgeon dropped, Everybody flocked to the Great Lakes to keep that money train going, um, and it became that secondary source of meat and caviar uh, once the Delaware Bay stocks of Atlantic uh, collapsed. 
So Lake Erie, this was talked about a little bit this morning, but this, this is really kind of a mind-blowing figure to me when I, was, when I looked at it again as I was preparing this talk. So the national lake sturgeon harvest in 1885 was, um, I believe, 8.6 million pounds. 5.2 million pounds of that came out of Lake Erie alone that year. We, we were over half the harvest nationally here in New York. And the largest fishery was right here in Buffalo Harbor. They had a snagging fishery, they had a pound fishery, they had a gill netting fishery. And even as, as early as the 1880s and 1890s, there were reports by the US Fish Commissioner about the destructive habit of snagging fish on the spawning beds and how they knew that was destroying the stocks and it didn't stop. So and you can just, this fish has been <laughs> through so much in over 100 years and it's still here. It really is a testament, as Nancy was saying, to what this fish can endure over time. Um, I think the fact that the fishery crashed maybe what saved it, it became un unviable commercially. There wasn't enough there. And then people's um, sort of habit and memory dropped off of this being a resource that should be exploited. And they just honestly, especially in Lake Erie, weren't seen for years. So, so the commercial fishery in New York, New York for Lake Sturgeon was finally closed in 1976. It was listed as state threatened in 1983. Um, we do have remnant populations that, you know, have recovered slowly on their own in Lake Champlain, the St. Lawrence River, and its tributaries. And as um, was said this morning by Chet, New York, obviously we share the border with, with Vermont and Lake Champlain, but none of the spawning has ever been documented on the New York side. Um, we have a uh, big population remaining in the St. Lawrence River and its tributaries. We have the lower Niagara, and apparently there was a holdover, there were holdovers in Lake Erie and Ontario, but they were not showing up very often. So the active recovery program, or DEC, and all of these wonderful partners that we brought in to the, to the, the show here, uh, that began in 1992. And um, there was a stocking program established. So we've done you know, the established populations in Oneida Lake, which you're going to hear about um, a little later. They're an amazingly fast-growing population. Um, we have some in Cayuga Lake, which have not done as well. And we impacts. We've established, we established a population in the Genesee River, the Upper Oswegatchie, the Rack of the St. Regis, and the Santa River up in Franklin County. Um, <coughs> it's interesting, all of these populations have shown some slightly different characteristics, slightly different tendencies towards, towards residency or wandering. Um, so a lot of the stuff we heard this morning from the other lakes, just the variation between the Canadian River populations and the Upper Great Lakes populations is all <coughs> mirrored, I think, across our range just in New York State. It's really interesting to hear your talks this morning. So we do have, finally, some evidence of natural recruitment in these stock populations. We've only handled a few naturally reproduced fish, but the signs are there. We've seen lots of gravid females and running males in some of these areas. Um, and there's definite signs of recovery in these other remnant populations that we haven't stopped. So the news is actually quite good. So, the Buffalo Harbor Adult Index, we went from not knowing they were there, probably a decade plus ago, to having annual adult index netting uh, that's handled 149 adult sturgeon since 2012, <coughs> compared to four that were encountered by the Lake Erie Systematic Sampling Program in 20 years. So, I think that's pretty impressive, <laughs> but as we found out, you have to target the fish. You know, you have to go where the fish are. Um, Eastern Lake Erie appears to be a very friendly habitat for sturgeon year-round. Um, they're growing fat and happy and kind of hanging out all year. And you'll hear more about that in one of the upcoming talks. We have a long and hopeful data set showing a strong population cohort in the Lower Niagara River. You'll hear about that from our current president. <laughs> um, we have impressively high survival rates of stock cumulants in both the Genesee River and Oneida Lake. That's, we know that due to our, our incredible partners that have been tracking that data for us. We have stellar growth rates, rates in Oneida, better than Winnebago. We have um, population growth in that, that holdover population in the St. Lawrence River, and it's spreading out strongly in the St. Lawrence Trips, and especially in our stock populations, we're seeing great growth and survival. <coughs> so, this is just some of the wealth we have here. This picture is um, from a newspaper article from Alexandria Bay, New York, up on the St. Lawrence. This poor gentleman here was a full-time sturgeon fisherman when the Depression hit and he was on welfare. He um, 
was bragging in the bar about some of the sturgeon he caught and how much it was worth, and he was thrown off the welfare rolls uh, because it was so much money at that time. Um, this is <laughs> one of our. Oops, sorry. This is one of our monsters that was that was handled, I think, by Don's crew. Uh, Don Dittman's crew. This is one that washed up, I believe. Some of you refresh my memory. This is one of our former fishery managers in Region 9. And I think this fish washed up and was over seven feet long. And uh, not that he's, he was terribly tall, from what I understand, Mr. Murray. But, uh, <laughs> but a big fish. <laughs> uh, one of the few that was seen in that interim period. And obviously, these are some eggs that were found in one of those uh, dragon females. And these are just some of the juveniles that get handled these days. We do see them occasionally, and their survival has been shown to be great. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to all the partners who are going to be presenting today. And uh, you know, I hope you stick around for these talks because it's a lot of really good news. Thank you. Lisa did an excellent job being exactly on time, so we have plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just curious on, uh, you, you talked about Genesee River, Oswegatchie, and Simon, other rivers, that is there something common between them, such as maybe a water temperature or, or a type of habitat that, that you found that, that works best for their development? For their well, for their well, for their their, well their own benefit and like yeah. They all, they're a lot of them are within known historic areas, so there's a known historic population in Genesee. All those tributaries in the St. Lawrence River were pretty much documented to have them, but the car the habitat characteristics, there's suitability indices that have been developed, and a mixture of rocky and sandy. You know, you have to have <coughs> the they eat a lot of bugs, they eat a lot of zebra mussels, they eat a lot of. Uh, round gobies now. Yeah. So before that, they ate other things, but you know, coronamids and polychaetes and polychaetes and stuff. Like this. If the food's there, if the substrate's there, they seem to thrive as long as they have a water quality. They're pretty resilient in their own way. But stick around. People are going to be talking about that stuff. <laughs> There's another one. Can you go give me a little bit more information on the actual? Possible population in Hugo Lake. You said that it wasn't as well, mm -hmm. possibly because of the lamprey. Uh, I found some netting during the lake trout egg takes that targeted those, that targeted lake surgeon. Yes. And I didn't think we did too bad as far as what we were bringing in. It's a pretty good size fish. I'm going to dip this Emily here. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, do you want to field that? Because you know a little bit. I mean, we had talked about this a little bit, but. Um, we had a big year <coughs> class of of sea lamprey in Kinga Lake a couple years ago. And I don't, with that lake trout netting that we've done that I've been involved with too, we don't have enough net sets to do a statistical test to say whether there's more now or fewer than there were before. But we definitely saw sea lamprey moons on the Kinga Lake Lake sturgeon. And, and we know from the literature that they don't tend to survive those penetrating moons. So, and we've seen no, no evidence of recruitment at this point either. That's one of our concerns, that if there are young fish in the lake, and it's a big lake, it's a deep lake, it's hard to sample. I mean, you guys do a great job with the, the hatchery staff doing the gill netting for us. But it's kind of telling that we're not seeing any love. The, the fish have been in there a long time. It was one of the large initial stocking efforts, and they're just, we're not well, seeing success. Plus, we weren't having anything out of juvenile size either. Right. They were all very large. Right, understood. Probably would have made this It depends on how deep they are, how many they are. So it's it's been shown to be a, it's shown been shown to be a significant factor in mortality. But we don't, as Emily said, we don't have a robust enough data set. But it's it's telling that we're seeing that those wounding rates have gone up significantly. So we're hopeful that there may be something, but we're not sure. Okay, time for one more. No, the camera. <laughs> 